<laughs> All right, well, let's get started. Um, welcome to uh, our CI class, the, uh, almost the end of the beginning. We've got two more classes to go, which will be the um, end of the beginning. It will be the end of classes, but the beginning of your uh, Catholic, um, pretty close to the start of your Catholic uh, uh, experience. So if we haven't scared you off yet, then uh, there's hope. <laughs> um, Darren pointed out that is tonight is Our Lady of Lords uh, Memorial. Um, so I wanted to quickly um, share with you again to remind you about uh, Lords, about Our Lady of Lords. Read you the profile off a. Of, this is off the uh, La Date uh, app for your phone. Um, free app. It's got prayers, saints of the day, and all that sort of stuff. Brittany wants to know what the password is. Oh. <laughs> it was online. Um, somebody have it because I have taken my cheat sheet away. If anybody has the password, Brittany needs it. 62533. 62533. Thanks. Like, uh, Correct. Like 62053. Three. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, we'll be on the lookout for her. Um, okay. Um, talk amongst yourselves for a second because we're going to. See if she shows up here. Darren, watch the uh, big TV, and if you see <laughs> message pop up, that uh, oh, there she is. Brittany's here. Okay. Okay, Our Lady of Lords. The memorial commemorates 18 apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary to St. Bernadette uh, Sobri Sobrio that occurred between February 11th and July 16th of 1858 near the town of Lourdes in the Hauts Pyrenees region of France. Though there would be some other people with her, only St. Bernadette could see the lady. And if you're not mute, muted, Mute yourself. <laughs> During the ninth appearance on February 25th, the lady told Bernadette to drink from a spring that suddenly appeared in the grotto where the apparitions occurred. During the 12th appearance on March 1st, a visitor washed her arm in water from the spring and some nerve damage in it was immediately cured. There is a tradition of miraculous cures at the grotto or received by those who drink or are bathed in its waters. Bernadette later said that the water had no special properties, but it helped focus the faithful who received the cures through faith and prayer. During the 13th appearance on March 2nd, the lady told Bernadette to tell local priests that they should build a chapel at the grotto and have processions to be made to it. The priests were understandably skeptical, but due to the numbers of pilgrims coming to the area, construction of several churches were started within a few years. During the 16th appearance on May, March 25th, the lady identified herself as the Immaculate Conception. Due to the number of people gathering at the site and making treks to the area on June 8, 1858, the mayor of Lourdes barricaded the grotto and stationed guards to pre prevent public access. Visitors were fined for kneeling near the grotto or talking about it, and Bernadette saw the last appearance of the lady from outside the barricade. The grotto was reopened to the public on October, in October 1858 order of Emperor Louis Napoleon III, and the pilgrims have not stopped coming since. It's a cool little movie. I think I mentioned that before, older movie, but um, colorized movie uh, about um, the song of Bernadette that uh, tells that same story in a very nice way. So let us pray the prayer to Our Lady in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Cool. All right. Well, you should be seeing my screen. Uh, somebody confirm that. Um, the church uh, website. Somebody confirm that if you're online. 
We're, we're good. Yes. All right. Good deal. Um, and just to pause for just a second about the, the church website, it's very good and um, it's got a lot of resources on it. Uh, you know, Lent's coming up, which will be our topic of discussion next week. Um, scheduling a, one day in Lent for to pray and fast for vocations and a little leadership guide there is for you. Um, some things about Lent, we'll talk about that next week, but these resources are all there um, for you. Formed is a very good spiritual aid. Um, prayers, special prayers uh, in particular, prayers for our nation, so forth. A little note from our leader, cousin uh, Jeff Bahi there. Father, cousin Jeff, whatever we call him. Um, and um, some other Catholic news services and things, but that's just the homepage. Um, so there's lots of stuff uh, here uh, as resources for you. Jumping off stages, if you will, for a few things um, for, your, for your spiritual guide. So encourage you to make visit to the parish home site uh, often. Um, but what we want to talk about tonight is um, being involved. You know, it's a life of prayer. Uh, we're talking about prayer. We've talked a lot about individual prayers, uh, ways to pray, types and forms of prayers. Uh, we got into the minutia all about that. Um, but really, our life is a prayer. Our entire being should be one of prayer. Everything we do should be oriented towards God and building the kingdom, uh, being thankful for work, being thankful for family, being thankful for an old pickup truck that barely runs anymore. Uh, you know, being, being thankful and prayerful always. St. Francis said, pray always, if, if necessary, use words. You know, you live the life of prayer. Um, in, in our parish life, we have opportunities to physically be involved and to give back and to build up the kingdom of God. Uh, and you all have experienced it if you've grown up in a church setting of any sort. Um, you know, lots of ways to participate in feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and doing the, being the hands and feet of Christ. Uh, so if you are new to the parish, though, uh, it can be daunting can be intimidating. Uh, Deborah and I moved here. She had been a member of this parish since she was a, little, uh, since she was a teenager and um, had been here since before Zachary was Zachary, you know, all crazy and stuff. But we had lived in Baker for a while and moved to back to Zachary. And even then it was, uh, it was so many new people moving in. It can be intimidating to meet the new people because you feel like, hey, I'm the new people. And then new people would come in behind us and we're like hesitant to meet them because we felt like we're still the new people. Uh, so sometimes you just got to jump in with both feet and, uh, and be involved. Um, you know, find, find a ministry that you might be comfortable with. Try it out. If you don't like it, quit going. <laughs> but if you like it, you know, it can be a, a lifetime uh, ministry. It certainly leads you to other things. So we, on our webpage, it's easy to find because it says get involved. It says get involved. Um, and so if you just look at the different organizations, you'll see a list of different organizations available to us. Um, now, just a word of caution, if, like I say, if you're new to the Catholic faith, uh, don't feel like you have to jump in and, and, and get, get busy on something. If that's your nature, if that's what you, kind of the way you're wired together, that's fine. But uh, um, if you need some time to really uh, ingest, if you will, um, this new Catholic thing uh, and really kind of focus on your prayer life at the mass, those sorts of things, cool, that's good. Give yourself six months, a year, um, you know, if that's your preference. So just that word of warning. But a lot of people are anxious to get involved. And when you are, um, here's a nice place to, to jump off. Of course, usually the best way to get involved with stuff is, you know, from a friend. You know, Darren tells me, you know, hey, uh, Knights of Columbus is a cool organization, and he brings me along to a meeting or, you know, gets me introduced to some people, or the men's club is cool, and somebody else leads you to it, or there's a work day on a Saturday, and you, you hear about things. So the 
one-to-one -one co um, uh, communication is, is always the best. But I'll use this opportunity to describe a few of the um, organizations that we have. Uh, one is the men's club, and obviously it's, it's for men. There's also a you know, ladies ultra society, which is similar. But you don't have to be Catholic to be uh, in the men's club. Uh, anybody can join. In fact, that's why it was formed. Uh, there was a, a gentleman that was a lifelong resident here. He passed away, but uh, his wife was Catholic, and he wasn't. But you know, he attended mass pretty frequently, and he knew most of the people here. And he just said, "Hey, there's no place for a non-Catholic to be involved at St. John the Baptist Catholic Church. You know, I'd like to do that." So uh, they sort of oriented a uh, a men's club. Uh, these are boots on the ground kind of people, and if that's you, if that's the way you are, this is the club for you. Um, they have meetings where they just plan to work, and then they go to work. <laughs> um, and you don't hear about them a lot. You know, they they literally hands and feet of Christ uh, out there, you know, building and preparing things for people who are in need. Uh, and they just quietly go about uh, doing all those sorts of things. They have their suppers too. They like to eat. That's one thing about Catholic organizations. We like to eat, which is probably true of most uh, most churches. <laughs> um, and that's probably why Jeff Richards is the uh, current pres president. He's a good cook. A <laughs> um, little history about them down there, um, which follows along the li lines I was uh, talking about. Uh, so swinging a hammer or, you know, carrying a wheelbarrow or, you know, painting and that kind of stuff is your thing. Men's clubs for you, really. Uh, Handmaids, I'd love to give you that one because now we talk about the ladies. Uh, Handmaids, this is an awesome organization. Uh, it's a women's group dedicated to Our Lady. Monthly evening meetings are open to women of all faiths. Uh, they encourage fellowship among women and foster a joyful sharing of our faith with each other. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, these, these are saints, man. Uh, I, I, for a while, we had meetings at the same time, and I was in here, and they were had their door open over there, and they were just having a good time, <laughs> uh, probably telling stories. But uh, but then uh, when time to pray, they really focus their prayer um, and really do good spiritual work. Um, they like to do scripture uh, study. Um, they like to review Catholic literature uh, and pray. Um, this is an awesome group, and they do uh, have mornings of reflection and retreats and things like that as the year goes goes around. Okay, so after you um, say you're a profession of faith and you're a Catholic after Easter and you are uh, of the male persuasion, somebody like Darren or me or somebody else will talk to you about the Knights of Columbus. So I'm wearing my Knights of Columbus shirt tonight showing off proud so that's us guys the, the little emblem here with the knights of columbus and darren's here and he you know he chime in a lot about the knights this is another boots on the ground uh group um a bit older formed in the early 1900s uh really uh, father uh, mcgiveny uh started the organization to um really focus on meeting the needs of uh, widows and orphans, which as you know, was a uh, you know, great, great number of those in the early 1900s for various reasons. Uh, but it's since grown into a tremendous organization. Um, the original chartered in 1882, uh, the KCs is a fraternal uh, benefit society. The order is still true to its founding principles of charity, unity, and fraternity. The Knights Charter was formed to render financial aid and other support services to members and their families. Mutual aid and assurance are offered to sick, disabled, and needy members of, and their families. Social and intellectual fellowship is promoted among members and their families through educational, charitable, religious, social welfare, war relief, and public relief work across the world. I mean, this is not a United States organization. This is an interconnected worldwide organization. Uh, and one of the ways they meet financial aid is uh, through insurance, <laughs> really. Uh, they're one of the highest uh, um, financially, uh, financially funded 
uh, uh, insurance organization, life insurance organizations in, in, in the world. Um, and I know I've owned uh, their life insurance uh, since, uh, geez, over 30 years now. And it's a very good, it's a very good investment and, and it's a very good way to uh, assure that if the breadwinner uh, should pass, um, that the family's taken care of. So original charter was to take care of widows and orphans. And so that's still true today. And they have a very practical way of doing that through insurance. Um, so um, a little bit more. The Knights of Columbus has become the world's foremost Catholic fraternal benefit society. The order has helped families obtain economic security and stability through its life insurance, annuity, and long-term care programs. That's something new, long-term care program, which is we have the benefit of growing older, we have financial obligations in our older age, uh, and has contributed time and energy worldwide to service in communities. Um, and so that's the other thing, right, Darren, about the Knights of Columbus. They're also along with the men's club. In fact, we often, you know, team up with the men's club and, um, you know, do physical charitable uh, projects, um, you know, around around town, around the around the uh, parish uh, complex here and, yeah, we've and some done, other things. We've done things like uh, donated money to help like uh, the pregnancy centers in Baton Rouge by ultrasound machines and uh, yep. give money to uh, some of the nuns. Like, like we've got some of the, one group of nuns that uh, helps out with the metanoia group, the, 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 uh, the human trafficking part. And so we've helped them out and, and, the, other, and the other nuns that I didn't realize that, but these nuns that we see at Clinton, they don't just help out at these two churches. I've seen them in St. Francisville. I've seen them at Lady of Mercy in Baton Rouge, and they go anywhere in the diocese where they needed to go. Because we got the largest group of nuns in the whole diocese right here. So we've helped them out, and we helped the visiting priests out, Father Chuck and um, Father Joe, and then to help you, mm -hmm. giving money to, to priests like them, and also the, and the community, the little community. Like, we haven't had it this past year because of COVID, but we usually have in October Tootsie Road Drive. And that's a worldwide thing. Everywhere they got nights of Columbus in the world. And all the Tootsie Roads that are sell are given to a local charity that stays in that community. So we spent about half our time raising money and, and the other half giving it away. <laughs> well, honestly, I think it's, it's about 90% of the time raising it and it's all given away in about 10%. Yeah, time. yeah. That's fun too, right? You know, you you, yeah. you do a little fundraiser. We had our golf tournament recently, which is our major fundraiser. Raiser, but then you know during the year, you know, as as the need comes up, we're able to help out folks and things, and and that's very rewarding. I want to say one more thing though. Uh, what I'm thinking about is uh, Father Michael and Jim Gibney, who founded the Knights of Columbus, just been declared blessed. Means there's one more miracle that's attributed to him. He'll be admitted to sainthood. And he started the Knights of Columbus when he noticed that every time the, the husband or the father passed away, it was, back in those days, they had like six, eight, ten kids, and the, the family was separated. The kids didn't just stay together. Two or three went here, and two or three went over there, and the mother couldn't keep the form with him because she, she just didn't have the, she wasn't able to keep it going. And Father called them into the parish to a meeting one day, and he said, "We got to do something about this." So they formed this organization, and, and they started going out. They would actually go out and help at the if, if uh, brother had lost his had died, passed. They went help his family with doing his form, so his family could stay together as a family. Great, yeah. It's a uh, strength in numbers, I guess, is uh, kind of the message too. You know, you form, join an organization like that whatever your preference is, and it's strength in numbers. You know, we're all able to do so much more when we, uh, when we join with a group like that. Uh, a lot of um, churches will take fish fries or some kind of- mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of organizations will do fish fries and that sort of thing. Well, COVID has knocked down things quite a bit. So uh, whether it be the religious edit uh, folks or somebody, so somebody's always doing a fundraiser, so. I just always bring a few extra bucks and uh, and uh, donate to whatever uh, whoever's got their hand out after after mass. <laughs> um, let me touch on Saint Vincent de Paul. I love this organization. They're awesome. 
awesome folks. If you're not familiar with uh, St. Vincent de Paul and Baton Rouge, we have real good leadership there uh, for the uh, regional uh, St. Vincent de Paul and the, the homeless uh, shelter that, that is uh, run. Um, so you see them on TV quite a bit. Um, so, uh, but St. Vincent de Paul, let me read to you a little bit about um, since its inception in our parish in 2015, thanks to our community support, we have been able to help over 1,250 families in crisis situations with basic needs such as housing, food, heat, water, and utilities. Uh, so the way it works is the parish gets a referral or it comes straight to the um, local St. Vincent de Paul chapter that somebody's in trouble. They're about to be evicted from their house or they have been evicted from their house and they have nowhere to go or the power is about to be turned off or they have some sort of physical need. And St. Vincent de Paul is organized to where they have trained people and it's not a big deal training. You or I could get trained pretty easily, but that you can go to that family and truly assess their needs and come up with a plan to, to help them. You know, it's not just show up and give money, right? It's okay, well, let's understand what's going on here. Uh, you know, why are they turning out your lights? Is it a misunderstanding or do you need, you know, some, some payments made? And then it's not just give them money and, and leave. It's um, let's get you on some sort of pathway to where this isn't happening a lot. You know, let's get you whatever, whatever the need is. And sometimes it means referring folks to other organizations that can better help them. But um, their goal is, you know, to meet the need where it is, right? Go right to the, you're, you're, you're getting your water turned off. Well, let's fix that today. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about how to avoid this. But today we're going to get you straightened out. Um, so it's a very good organization like that. They, but uh, that's the way they worked. It's a bit more organized and uh, a little bit more training. Um, so, just glance. Baton Rouge, they operate like a soup kitchen. Though. Yeah, in Baton Rouge, they have a soup kitchen. So, um, you know, sometimes we we pr practice our stewardship through the wallet, you know, and if uh, you can't physically participate for one reason or another, if you donate to good causes, obviously that's that's the way we can do stewardship. And I would highly recommend routine donations to St. Vincent de Paul especially the house in Baton Rouge where Darren mentions they, uh, you know, they provide for the physical needs uh, of the folks in trouble. You had a friend that St. Vincent de Paul helped out with some medication. Yeah, good, good point. They help out with that too. Sometimes the call comes into the uh, office that, um, you know, my prescription payment you know they want five thousand dollars and you know i'm a widow and i can't get out and i don't know what to do well the church you know gets the information call st vincent de paul they go do something you know they're ready to go they're ready to, to move and you know folks like ours at knights of columbus and men's club you know if you need a ramp built to your house or something like, okay we're gonna plan that and we're gonna get the money and do it and it might be a few weeks before we get around to it that's great. That's needed. That's important. But St. Vincent de Paul will go there physically. You know, they get the message, they get or in it, and they're there that day. So um, they're a rush to help and um, very impressive organization. Um, I think once a year they pass around a black bag for, for uh, donations. So when you're not paying attention and all of a sudden somebody passes a black bag for you, put a lot of money in it. <laughs> Because it's going to go to some very good use. Uh, there is, and I forget what the history behind the black bag is. They tell us every time they pass the black bag, but then I forget. Um, some of the other um, uh, groups um, that I just mentioned, uh, let's see. Uh, there's Altar Society both at here and one in uh, at Our Lady. And they take care of the um, they take care of the of the corporal needs of the church itself, the building itself. So, like the linens, the tablecloths, and, and things like that. Um, 
They're one of the oldest organizations at St. John's, that's very true, formed years ago by the ladies of the parish to assist the pastor with duties such as cleaning the church and taking care of the altar. Today, members are responsible for church decorations, the altar cloths and linens, and the candles, uh, the priest's vestments, and generally anything that helps make the worship space more inviting and prayerful for parishioners. Some of the members are also the church uh, sacristans, sacristans. And they keep replenishing the candles, too. They do. So, um, you know, if uh, you're not the type that swings a hammer, but, you know, you're, you like to deck, you know, keep things nice, neat and clean. And and, um, and at Easter and some of the other events, you know, they, they dress up the church and it's very nice. If that's your kind of thing, then um, Ultra Society is looking for help. And um, they do have regular meetings and kind of official membership, but um, um but that's what they do. And so church website has that information for you. Um, not on here because it's so big, but we'll have to talk about religious education. Um, if you have a talent uh, working with young people uh, and you are interested in being a uh, religious education teacher, um, then they always need help. <laughs> I remember when I was, uh, uh, well, I, I was 18 at St. Isidore, uh, that's where I grew up, and uh, Father uh, um, Maroney asked me to teach catechism class, so I did that over there, and then Deborah and I got married, and we lived in Baker for a while, and I taught, kept teaching CCD there, and then we moved to Zachary, and it was a year or two, but I, uh, I walked into the office there and uh, here at St. John's and said, uh, they didn't know me. And I said, well, do you need a CCD teacher? <laughs> she almost literally grabbed my shirt and, and pulled me in the office and said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a low bar <laughs> that they will accept you. Uh, they took me right in almost uh, sight unseen. Uh, but it's very rewarding to uh, to work with young people uh, of all of it, whatever age uh, likes you know is your preference. Uh, I always like to work with the high high school group crowd because uh, they make me laugh. But uh, so I was with um, high school CCD up till about ten years ago. We started doing uh, RCIA. But uh, uh, and if you know being in front of a classroom is not your thing, uh, number one, they don't really do it that way anymore. Uh, it's more of a kind of a group setting and then small group discussion uh, around the table. It's a lot more fun now, <laughs> uh, unless you had a great teacher like me, right, Spencer? <laughs> um, but a uh, little less formal classroom, a lot less formal classroom setting and more um, instruction. Now, that's for the middle school and the high school, the, the younger ages. You know, little kids are cool about, uh, sit, you know, being at the desk or whatever so they still do it the old-fashioned way but um you know there's no greater reward than to share your faith especially with young people um and that's really what's required a genuine uh faith sharing you know you can't fake it you can't fake it with kids <laughs> you know they call you out in a second uh, so if um if that's the sort of thing you're uh, interested in just show up one one morning when they're having CCD or one afternoon when they're having high school and uh, find whoever's in charge and they'll put you to work. And you don't have to be, you know, in front of the kids. You can, uh, you know, help in the background with, you know, various things that they do and activities that they have going on. Um, so it would, would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, religious education, uh, which is on a whole nother website on this on the church website. Along those lines, too, this organization, RCIA, is uh, always in need of, of, of folks to, to help out. So if you've had any sort of fun with this this year, then we always need some help. Uh, Darren showed up a couple of years ago and, um, you know, did some sponsoring, makes the coffee and turns the lights on and uh, is invaluable. I uh, couldn't do this without him. Um, so, um, um, you know, if, if that's if that's your interest more with the adult education, uh, that's certainly available to you. There is a homebound visitation group. Um, 
that serves a very vital role. You know, really the way it used to be, there were lots of priests. And when the uh, office got a call that somebody was ailing, a priest went to see him. Well, it's just not practical anymore. Uh, Father Jeff's got, you know, Zachary and Clinton and points in between and, and next to that. And he goes all the way up to the state line. You even got the the uh, little uh, prison uh, out here and on the other side of Zachary. Um, he's got that. He's got he's got quite a bit of numbers of people and geographical region to cover. Um, so this group is kind of fills the gap a bit on on uh, ministering to people who uh, who are homebound for one reason or another. They're organized into ten teams who regularly visit. Catholic residents of nursing homes and centers. So they, uh, and they go to the veterans home too, as well. I've, I'm always working, so I've never had an opportunity to go with them, but, um, but I'm told they have a good time. So that, that's a very important ministry uh, to be involved in. Let's see. Um, there used to be a coffee club there in hiatus right now with uh, with COVID, but that was my favorite group. Because uh, yeah, Darren's laughing because uh, Sunday morning breakfast uh, was uh, was always awesome. Uh, Sorry, the evening, no problem, no problem. Have a seat. Um, you know, we go to seven o'clock mass and then we come over here in this room and uh, have coffee and donuts and, and chit chat with everybody and little kids running around and stuff. But that just didn't happen. I mean, people, people behind the scenes, you know, making stuff and, and something like that. So, you know, if that's kind of your thing, you know, um, you're less of a be in front of people kind of person. You'd rather be behind the scenes, uh, you know, making the coffee and biscuits and uh, coffee clubs for you. This pandemic will end. Someday, somehow, it's going to end, and we will have a coffee club again. Uh, and they George going to start it up. <laughs> <laughs> I volunteer. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get up for Sunday mass, and of course, you fasted right for for uh, the Eucharist, and so by eight o'clock, you're ready for uh, to see what the coffee club's going to come up with. So, um, very important, important, vital role, I would call them. Um, yeah, there is a group of that. There is a group of Catholic daughters. Um, their chapter is not represented here. Is that, they don't have you it see on that? Some of them. <laughs> um, they just started, what, two years ago, I think. Was it two, last year or a year before? I think so. That's very new, and they, they haven't done much. It seems like it's been a year, but last year, COVID hit, so it must have been two years ago they got started. Yeah. So here's the welcome committee. Um, they are a ministry dedicated to ensuring that visitors and new members are greeted personally and extended a warm welcome to our faith community. Um, welcome committee members wear name badges and are in the vestibule to greet new people as they leave mass. Obviously this was before COVID and we will do it again. Um, like I said at the beginning, it's difficult, especially in a growing, parish like this in a, in a big parish with a lot of people uh, to catch the newcomers. So what, what this group tried to do was to have a sort of in your face, I'm here to welcome you <laughs> kind of presence. Uh, you know, not hollering and grabbing people. It's just that, you know, we announce at mass the welcoming committee members in the back map, back church. And if you want to register or whatever, um, so in back mass, we're standing back there. I used to be in this club. It's kind of fun. And you'd have your name badge on and you're looking for people to make eye contact, you know, and then, and then it's that awkward thing. Are you new or have you been here for 20 years? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm new. I've been here 20 years. Sometimes that would be the answer, you know? And, uh, um, so, so we doing that little physicality part of it. Um, trying to find folks, but, um, uh, you know, um, find out who they are, you know, they got some kids and, you know, okay, well, you're interested in swimming. We got that YMCA. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, you know, yeah, this family over here is involved in that. Well, okay, well, fine. Now they got a new friend. You know, that's kind of the way it works. Um, so it's a, you know, if you're interested in a kind of low budget uh, way to be involved, this is easy breezy. 
Um, you know, it's just uh, when your turn comes up, you just stand outside after mass and say hello to people <laughs> and try to get them, uh, you know, at least a physical verbal contact with someone, you know, in the church to try to ingrain people. This is a good picture because this is my mom. <laughs> Why is it so hard for people to talk to people like that in a social setting where everybody's together? You know, I don't know why it's so hard to talk to people when, you know, it, I think, I know the problem here is everybody thinks they're new. Even people who've been here for a long time. And Clinton is, I guess because it's so small. Right. It's, it's just like, mm -hmm. it, it was like that was legitimate. Yeah, it's got the country feel to it and everybody knows everybody. And if you don't, if you're, the, if the there's one person there that's not, Part of the regulars, it's like, hey, honey, who are you? <laughs> it's just the way country people are, you know. Zachary used to be like that, and you know, there's wonderful people here, but it's just so many. It was it's just so many people. It was sort of like that in 2001 when my wife and I moved here. Yeah. When the church was right here, and it wasn't that large, and everybody was, I mean, everybody knew everybody. My father says, they better not sit in your spot. <laughs> yeah. All that. Don't sit in your spot. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so the only way we fix it is we got to fix it ourselves. We got to be the ones that are saying hello to folks. So anyway, um, so this is a great group. Uh, um, you just call the church office to be involved in that group. Um, I would encourage you to sign up, and when COVID's over, they'll put you to work. But just call the church office. Pretty much for any of these committees, um, you know, calling the church office is the easiest thing to do. Uh, which ones have we not? Uh, oh, helping families heal. You didn't talk about the choir. I did not talk about the choir. Thank you, Darren. Um, it's not listed here as a committee, um, but obviously. Do you have to be a good singer to be in the choir? Well, I was in the no. choir. They let, me out. they let Darren in. <laughs> Daddy always said, I was in there for about five years. <laughs> you know, if God gave you a croaker, then just croak. That's the way you That was you a just strange sing. thing, too, because all of a sudden, it's like God just shut that down and opened arms to God. And the night yeah, God will put you to work. <laughs> um, I'm starting to see that the uh, that feeling is, is mutual all the way around. I mean, they let him felt right. They, they let you apply. <laughs> you know, it's, they're, they're promoting. Right. Yeah. A, lo a low bar. It is a low bar for all these groups. They will put you to work. What Molly and Dave will say in the choir is we get together and make a joyful noise. Yeah. Yeah. Were you a better singer before you entered or after you entered the choir? Probably after. <laughs> if you did, so I you had to prove it. I picked up some. Well, I had played some musical instruments when I was young, so I could read music, but I never sang. I never had practiced my vocal. So I got a little better. That's all gone out the window now. I've been out about two or three years. Um, I think that about covers all the groups um, in ways to be involved. You um, didn't talk about ushers or anything like that. Yeah, ushers are not on here. Scouting's on here. If uh, there's a chapter associated with with uh, the parish, um, if you would like to be um, involved in liturgical ministries. Um, ushers, readers, that sorts of thing. Uh, just call the church office. Um, so if you have a nice speaking voice uh, and would like to read at mass, then um, they, I mean, there's three masses a weekend here and then uh, mass in Clinton. So, you know, if you have two, two readers per mass, do the math and that, that's a lot of people. And then we have, um, you know, special observances, Easter and, for example, and things like that, where we need more readers. So it's a, it's a long list and it rolls over pretty fast. Um, so if you uh, feel comfortable uh, reading in, at Mass, then that's, uh, that's, that's the thing to do. Um, let's see. Now, yeah, here's the here's the rest of them. Altar servers. If you have you know kids that want to be uh, altar servers and adults as well, you know um, that that's a that's a good ministry. Certainly, call the office and and do that. 
there's Eucharistic ministers as well. Um, now you have to be asked to be a Eucharistic minister, uh, but it's a great uh, honor and privilege to, to do that. Um, here's the uh, note about music ministries. Uh, see if I missed any. Garen talked about. Yep, yeah, here's our here's our friends Molly and David. Um, but there is also a youth choir, and they'll start up again as well after COVID. But um, just call the church office and um, and say you want to be in the choir, or you have a kid that wants to be in a choir. It's actually, three choirs. Joe. Youth. Oh, the so youth children, has children, youth, children and youth, and adults. Yeah, yeah. So David and Molly, they're they're, act, they're called pandas, but, but they're actually, uh, I, I guess, uh, far far directors. They teach three different choirs. They called Boudreaux to be in a choir, but he croaked. But <laughs> <Ba> I'm <-dum> <laughs> I know two people I was in the choir with passed away since I got out. Uh, and here's the note about lectors, and, and you can volunteer to be a lector. Um, you don't have to try out, but you can volunteer to be a lector. Uh, but you do have to be in a state of grace with the church uh, and be able to receive the sacrament of Eucharist. So um, just, just a note. <laughs> um, okay, I think that covers all those. Um, and like I say... Um, Contributing financially to the uh, to the uh, parish is important. Um, your money obviously goes to uh, very good causes. All these things don't just happen. Sometimes they take a little grease, a little money. Um, there's easy ways to give. You can get put money in the basket. Um, you can do, do uh, online giving. If you would, if your intention is to, to join the parish, and it sounds like all of you are, uh, if you haven't already done so, please fill out a parish registration. The forms are in the back of church, uh, and I think you can either mail them in or put them in the uh, basket or hand them to an usher, something like that. Um, that way you get, um, you know, information. You get, uh, and, uh, they'll be able to send you the uh, envelopes if, if it's more comfortable for you to put, put things in the envelope. But if um, you can also do um, automatic online giving uh, and make it easier to uh, to assist uh, and do ministry and stewardship through uh, through financial means. Questions? Questions about all that? Get involved <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> I have one message in the chat. Yes. Oh. It's like I heard before, okay. you know, you get out of it what you put into it. You know? Okay. Uh, unless anybody has any questions, comments, criticisms, or complaints, I'll, I'll stop the recording and be done with today's meeting. I got one order of business to cover with you after that. So last call. Good. Last call for what? <laughs> Darren. Wait there. Not there. Not there. That's after. Okay. Um, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. St. Bernadette, pray for us. Amen. Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to stop recording, but if y'all would hang on uh, for a second online here. Um,